been asked to speak on worship, music, and hymnody from a reform perspective. And specifically, I've been asked to address church music, specifically what church music should a reformed church have in worship. And to help us think that through, I want to make a series of assertions. I'm going to make 14 assertions followed by a 15th suggestion that is going to have multiple points under it. Uh, and that means I could go on for several hours, but I'm going to constrain myself and uh, simply make these assertions and, and make note of them. By the way, I'll make this available to you when we're done. Uh, I'll send this to Kirk and Chuck and David and whoever gets these things out to everybody so that you will have the full text of what I'm saying. But I, I, will, I will ad lib a little as I go along. So take notes under the points if you want to argue with me or ask, for, ask questions or disagree or ask for further clarification, etc. By the way, um, disagreeing with me on this is not a crisis. Uh, if if you if you know I I, I, you know, I I am perfectly capable of being fallible, and I am keenly aware uh, of the fact that I am not uh, familiar with all of the dynamics of your particular context. Listening to your interaction with Dr. Hall helped me a lot. Uh, to know a little bit more about what you're facing. I know a whole lot more about what we face in the United States than I do in Eastern and Southern Europe. Uh, and so feel free in the Q&A to take it in a direction where it is more uh, contextually specific to your situation. And I'll do my best to be uh, a help to you. But uh, please know that feel free to disagree with me. Uh, and I'll try and do the best I can to make a biblical account for what I'm saying. Uh, now, before I make that series of uh, 14 assertions followed by a suggestion, I want to I want to make several preliminary comments. And this this first comment follows on uh, what Dr. Hall just said in his answer to the last question, and I and it's. What he just said is huge, so I want to reiterate it. How we worship, including what we sing, disciples our congregation. That, that is true whether you like it or not. What you do in public worship disciples your congregation because how we worship determines who we worship. And therefore, the content of public worship is the major factor in the discipleship of your congregation. And so hear, hear this loud and clear. If what you preach is different from what you sing, your people will believe what they sing, not what you preach. It's it just, it's huge for you to understand that. Uh, number two, uh, American evangelical worship has been profoundly affected by four factors. And, I, and why am I speaking of American stuff when you guys are ministering in, in Europe, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, etc.? Because sadly, American stuff has influenced the whole world and oftentimes not for the better. OK, let, let, let me just, you know, as an American, let me apologize I apologize for the stuff that we that we send out to the world. It becomes your problem, but it's generated by us. OK, so there are four things that have profoundly influenced American evangelical worship. Number one, commercial popular music. Uh, this really started in the radio age in the early 1900s. It picked up steam during the television age and it is even more picked up steam during the internet age so commercial popular music hugely impacts american evangelical worship number two american evangelical worship has been profoundly influenced by the christian music industry uh recently there was a study shown that the top 
25 uh, worship songs on the charts in the United States are all produced by a handful of American evangelical mega churches. So, and, and there is big money involved in that. It is about money. It is not about what is pleasing to God, edifying to the congregation, faithful to scripture. It is about money. And, um, and, and that profoundly influences American evangelical worship. Number three, American evangelical worship has been profoundly influenced by Pentecostalism. Uh, by the way, you were talking about Scott Hahn. Scott Hahn was barely in the PCUSA. He was really from a Pentecostal background. And he was in the PCUSA for just a few years. And he knew that he could get a lot of attention by saying that he was a Presbyterian who'd become a Roman Catholic. He was barely a Presbyterian, uh, really from a Pentecostal. My wife went to Gordon Conwell Seminary with Scott Hunt. So I can tell you all about Scott. I can, I can tell you about the day that David Wells looked at him in classroom and said, Scott, if you keep on down that direction, you're going to end up a Roman Catholic. Uh, and uh, so anybody wants to ask about Scott Hunt, I can tell you about Scott Hunt. Uh, but Pentecostalism has had a profound effect on American evangelical worship. And then here's, here's, here's a fourth factor that's huge in American evangelical worship. Uh, American evangelical worship has been profoundly influenced by a philosophy of ministry that says, use your music as something to attract the unchurched to public services. That is, that is a huge factor uh, in what has happened in American evangelical worship. And, and, and it, th those four things have led to a lot of bad stuff in American evangelical uh, worship. Now, here's my third preliminary point before I get to my 14 assertions and my, uh, and my uh, 15th suggestion. Even Reformed churches have been impacted by this. Even Reformed churches have been impacted by this. And in, in, in fact, I think in two ways, Reformed churches have been impacted by this. One, entertainment drives so much that goes on in American evangelical worship, and it's even impacted Reformed churches. And I, I, I think you can tell from Dr. Hall's exposition, entertainment has zero to do with biblical worship in the Old or the New Testament. You know, what passage is there about how we need to be entertained in public worship? Zero. There is zip, nada, nothing, nil about entertainment in worship in the Bible. But that is a huge factor, even in Reformed churches, the entertainment mindset. Uh, I, you know, I come to worship, I come to this church because I like their music. What what that's an entertainment mindset. Um, and of course, that factors into the second thing that I want to mention, and that's preferences. Um, musical style preferences uh, flow out of this sort of consumer mindset. Uh, you know, what, what Dr. Hall said about the audience of worship, you remember he, he quoted Kierkegaard, and then he later came back and talked about uh, Dr. Rayburn and what we learned together uh, under his teaching and Kurt Swanson and I also got to study under Dr. Rayburn. He was a, a, mar a marvelous theologian and pastor, but also a really good musician who had thought long and hard about these kinds of things. And um, the audience in worship is God. Uh, the, the, in, and American evangelicalism has thought of the main audience in worship since at least 1970 as being unbelievers. And therefore everything is designed to make them happy uh, as opposed to making God happy. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, the, 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 the audience is what they want, you know, give the people what they want, uh, give the consumer what he wants, give the customer what he wants. And so that issue of the audience of worship is huge. And you really have to think that through. So those are my uh, my preliminary remarks. Now, here are my 15 points. And I'll try and keep my eye on the, the, the clock so that we have plenty of time to interact over this. 
because I'm not going to have the amount of time that I would like to do to do biblical theology and exposition on these things. We can try and work through that in the, in the Q and a, okay, here, here are my assertions. Number one, for most of Christian history, most Christians have mostly sung psalms, mostly without musical accompaniment. Uh, I just think we all need to know that before you start talking about music in, the, in, in worship, before you talk about what you sing, before you talk about how you do it, all of us need to admit, I, I, I have worshiped in the context of exclusive non-instrumental psalm singing worship. When I was in Scotland, I worshiped with the, in the context of the Free Church of Scotland, where they did not use musical instruments and they only sang uh, canonical songs, uh, most of which had been translated in the 17th century. Uh, and I love, I loved that context. Now, most of my life, I have been in the context of both hymn and psalm singing Presbyterians. So what I would say is most of my life, I've been in a context where we have had inclusive psalmody and inclusive hymnody together with musical instruments. That's the context where I've lived most of my life. But wherever your background is, all of us need to remember this. I'll say it again. For most of Christian history, most Christians have mostly sung psalms, mostly without musical accompaniment. Now, I think there are at least two deductions that we need to learn from that assertion. Number one, even if we sing extra canonical hymns and songs, we all ought to sing psalms. Uh, the Psalms need to be a part of the diet of what is sung in our worship. Uh, and that means for most of us, we need to sing more Psalms than we're singing. Uh, because even in my context, which is a pretty conservative American Presbyterian context, we don't sing nearly as many Psalms as all Christians. By the way, Catholics, Lutherans, Reformed, you, you name it, almost all Christians until the 19th century mostly sang psalms uh, when, when you were in public worship. And in the last 150 years, the psalms have just taken a nosedive in the, in, in the amount of time that they are used for public worship. And so almost all of us ought to sing more psalms. Second implication of that first point is that we need, at the very least, to be careful about how we deploy musical instrumentation and its influence in our services. We've got to be very, very careful uh, about that. Okay, here's my second assertion. Everything done in worship is meant to serve the praise of God, first and foremost, including music, and what we sing. And that means that our preferences cannot be the first issue in determining what and how we sing. But the, the first issue is what serves the praise of God. That's, that's the very first question, what serves the praise of God? And of course, where do we go to find that out? We go to the Bible. So that you know, that's what you've done in this last hour and a half with David Hall. He's taken you to the Bible so that we're not just talking about what we want to do in worship. We're talking about what God wants us to do in worship. And somebody said that they're translating my little book, Does God Care How We Worship? That, By the way, that book is an edited edition of a larger volume, which I commend to you, uh, called Give Praise to God. And it was, a, uh, it was a book written in honor of James Montgomery Boyce. Uh, Phil Riken, Derek Thomas, and I edited that volume together. Uh, it has wonderful chapters on almost all of the aspects of public worship. And uh, my little book, Does God Care How We Worship, is basically a, a simple argument for what is known as the regulative principle of worship, um, that the Bible gives us the warrant for what we do in worship. 
Uh, what we do in worship is not a matter of, you know, our, our determination. It's, it's a matter of what God has told us to do. And the principle behind that, of course, is if God is an infinite, eternal, and unchangeable spirit, and he is, how is it that you worship him? How, how, do you, how do you know how to approach him and worship? And the only answer to that question, according to John 4, is however he tells you to. I mean, how, how, how do you know how to approach an infinite, eternal, unchangeable spirit? You can't know unless he tells you. And thank God he did. And he tells you everything you need to know in the Bible about how you need to approach him. So everything that David Hall just did has to do with the answer of this assertion that everything that we do in worship is meant to serve the praise of God. What is that? It's what he tells us to do in the Bible. So there, you know, there's a whole biblical theology. By, by the way, my, um, my, my theology of worship course is available entirely online for free through the Reformed Theological Seminary mobile app, which you can download to any kind of uh, cell phone that you have or any kind of, any kind of computer or tablet that you have. By the way, there are 45 courses complete for free uh, on that RTS mobile app. My Theology of Worship is where I take uh, 26 hours to, to try and do what I'm doing in, uh, in 40 minutes with you this morning. So feel free to go, and, and I give a whole lot of biblical argumentation for these points that I'm just outlining for you today. So I try to tackle these things there. Um, okay, here's my third, third assertion. Therefore, if everything that we do in worship is meant to serve the praise of God, therefore, what we sing in worship and its musical forms must first and foremost aid the congregation's public praise of God. Uh, when we think about music and we think about singing, we have to think first, how is this going to help the congregation praise God? That, that is the first, not, the, not how are we going to make an unbeliever happy? How are we going to cater to people's musical preferences? No, no, no. How do we help the whole congregation worship God? How do, how do we help them give praise to God? That's our first question. And this means that mere musical style preferences cannot be the first consideration in, 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 in our choices. And positively, it means that we need to think wisely and comprehensively about a variety of matters to aid our singing. By, by the way, things as simple as this, what is the range of our people's voices on the whole. You can't sing something that's too low pitched for them to sing. You can't sing something that is too high pitched for them to sing. Um, the, um, the American, the United States national anthem is an excruciating song to try and sing. And one of the problems with it is the upper range is higher than most Americans can sing. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, when you're choosing music in the church, you need to ask the question, is this too high for the people to sing? Is it too low for the people to sing? It's th that simple. You're just, you're thinking about practical matters in what people sing. Okay. Number four, here's my fourth assertion. Our singing in public worship is fundamentally by the redeemed to the redeemer about the redemption. Our singing in worship is fundamentally by the redeemed to the redeemer about the redemption. And that means that the content of our singing is not driven by the preferences of unbelievers or the concerns of the world. Because it's by the redeemed, to the redeemer, about the redemption. Ooh, we could go on a long time about that, but I'm going to go on to point five. Music, as distinct from singing, 
often takes a more prominent role in our current expressions of public worship than it did in the New Testament. Music, as distinct from singing, often takes a more prominent role in our current expression of public worship than it did in the New Testament. Let me, let me try and explain what I'm getting at by that statement. In the United States, it is often said by pastors, and some of you may be aware of a, of a very famous and influential American evangelical pastor named Rick Warren. Uh, Rick Warren has extensive influence in American evangelicalism, and some of that influence is not for the better. And one of the things that he said about 30 years ago uh, is that you ought to let your culture determine your musical style. Uh, he, he, he literally said, let your culture determine your worship. What he meant by that is build your worship around a particular musical style that you want to use to attract a certain type of person. Nowhere in the Bible is anything like that said. Nowhere. And uh, it, at, at his church, they, they literally divided up worship into a, a multiple groups of musical styles. So if you liked Ohana music, you could go to the Ohana worship. If you liked country and Western music, you could go to the country and Western uh, worship. If you liked rock, you could go to the rock uh, worship service. If you liked, uh, you know, it, 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 they divided the church up into musical style preferences as a way of what? Attracting people who liked those particular music styles. That's an awful idea. It's an absolutely awful idea. And so I apologize for Americans uh, for coming up with that idea. And we've infected the whole world uh, with that, uh, that idea. You know, really all Christians, all Christians until about the 19th century, uh, Catholic, Protestant, whatever, uh, utilized musical forms that had been specifically crafted for utilization in the church. Since the 1950s, American evangelicals have tried to grab what we might call secular forms and utilize them as the substance of what we do uh, in public worship. And it's, it's been a problem. Uh, here's the second thing I want to say about that point. The New Testament does not talk at all about instrumentation or musical styles. So the, if we use instruments, you have to think about it. But you can't make that the key. Uh, and that kind of goes back to what David Hall said about um, electricity. Uh, American uh, evangelical worship is heavily electricity dependent. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it is not uncommon now to walk into large American evangelical uh, churches and there are both sound and light shows that are involved in public worship. Well, obviously, until about 150 years ago, that was not the case anywhere in the history of Christianity. Uh, most public worship of Christians has been unplugged, as they say. Uh, it's not dependent upon electronics. Um, okay, here's my sixth assertion. We're, we're already at nine o'clock, so I've got to I've got to hustle through the rest of my assertions. Uh, or ten, uh, nine o'clock my time, ten o'clock most of my colleagues' time, eight o'clock some of my time, and then who knows what time for the rest of y'all. But here we go. Uh, number six, musical style preference is often too important to pastors, musicians, and people. A couple of deductions from that. American church appeals to distinctive musical styles and forms have actually exacerbated this. So that many, many church members, and, and, and look, even believers and even relatively mature Christian believers, uh, will make their they'll make their decisions about church attendance based on the musical forms. 
They just will. Uh, they may like your preaching and choose to go to another church because they like the musical style that, that is being utilized there. That's just, that's just the way it is. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how many times. Oh, pastor, I love your preaching, but the, the worship here at First Presbyterian Church is boring. Uh, and, and I, and I so love going to this church because they've got a great band, uh, and they sing songs that I like. I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've heard something like that. Uh, now bear this in mind. If you do have musicians that help you lead congregational worship, bear this in mind, pastors, the musicians who help to lead solid hymnody and psalmody and do it well are bored because the musical style is not challenging to them because it's not meant to be. It's meant to be easy enough for people in the congregation to sing. And so really good church musicians are bored all the time from a musical standpoint when they are helping the congregation sing well because they can't use all of their musical abilities. And this is one of the things that drives American worship. Musicians get into worship and they want to be able to use all their skills. That does not help congregational worship. Um, it just doesn't. Uh, congregational worship is pretty simple and good church musicians are bored to tears uh, when, when they're doing it because the style is deliberately simple enough that everybody in the congregation can sing it. And uh, so, so as pastors, you need to remember that. Uh, you know, pat, pat those, those musicians that help the congregation sing well, pat them on the back because they are bored to tears musically. Uh, in doing what they're doing, because it, the form has to be simple for everybody to be able to sing it. And you just, you just need to remember that. Um, okay, seventh assertion. Uh, our music, our singing especially, like every other aspect of worship, must pass the test of the catacombs. Now, David Hall actually said this in other words uh, just a few moments ago, but let me tell you what I mean. You can't make anything central to Christian worship that can't be done everywhere by any congregation under any circumstance, including people who are having to hide in some hole in the ground in order to worship God. Um uh, one of the very interesting things that you read about the Genevan Reformation is that when many French Huguenot folks got to Geneva, they escaped from France and got to Geneva. It was the first time they had ever been able to participate in worship where there was singing because they had to hide in houses and barns and other places to worship God. And if they sang, they would be discovered by the authorities and they'd be arrested. So many, if you, if you read the, the, the stories of them coming up to Saint-Pierre in Geneva uh, and hearing the congregation singing at the top of their lungs, these psalms in French, almost all of them broke down in tears crying before they ever got into the church because they had never heard singing like that. I hear the same thing from many Chinese Christians, that where they gather, they cannot sing. And when they are able to be in a place where they can sing, it overwhelms them that they're able to sing out loud to God. Well, if you make electronics and sound and light shows and, and a, a big worship band essential to Christian worship, it doesn't pass the test of the catacombs. Um, Christian worship has to be the, the, the essence of it has to be able to be done everywhere, including if you're gathered in the catacombs in Rome. Uh, number eight, our music, our singing, especially its content, but even its form, must prepare us for death and martyrdom. 
you know, uh, American worship music tends to be happy. It, it, I mean, it just does. It's, it's, it's almost all happy. Um, when you read the Psalms, a lot of the material of the Psalms are about people who are devastated, bereft, oppressed, persecuted, sad, grieving, almost despairing. I mean, think of Psalm 88. There's almost no hope in it, almost. And it's commanded to sing in worship. Many years ago, uh, Carl Truman asked the question, what can miserable Christians sing? We have to ask that question. And we, we have to, are, are we preparing our congregation for what to sing in the hour of their death and martyrdom? And, and so the content of what we sing, at, it, it least has to com, it has to comprise that. What am I going to give the people of God to sing in the hour of death? And it's not going to be a trite, superficial, happy, clappy sort of thing. It's going to be deep and substantial and reverential. And yes, it may instill joy and hope even in the hour of death, but it's got to be substantive. Our music, our singing, especially in its content, but even in its form, must prepare us for death and martyrdom. Are we preparing our people to sing when they are dying and when they are dying for God? Uh, that's just something we have to do. Ninth, music is not an element of worship. Singing is. Music is not an element of worship. Singing is. And that means that music is an aid to an element. Uh, you brought, really, what David Hall taught in the last hour, I would summarize in with this motto. We ought to read the Bible, preach the Bible, pray the Bible, sing the Bible, and see the Bible in the administration of the sacraments. Uh, that's what we, those five things we ought to do in public worship. Read the Bible, preach the Bible, pray the Bible, sing the Bible, see the Bible. I mean, I'm playing, see the Bible is playing off of Augustine's phrase that the sacraments are visible words. In, in baptism in the Lord's Supper, you actually see and hear uh, and smell and touch and taste the promises of God's word. Uh, whereas in the reading and preaching and praying and singing, you hear the promises of God's word. Um, and so that's what we ought to do in every public worship service. So we need to stress to the people that what God commands us to do is to sing to him, not to enjoy the music. He doesn't command us to enjoy the music. He, in, he, he commands us to sing, sing to him. And, I, and by the way, I, I love the, the brother who mentioned that he, he's a bad singer. Man, I have a special place in my heart for bad singers. My dad was a United States Marine, a faithful ruling elder, and he could not carry a tune in a bucket. Uh, he, he was an awful, awful singer. And I sat next to him my whole life in church. My, my mother was the, was the choir director. And so I sat next to my dad in public worship and he sang every hymn badly. And it made such an impact on me as a young man. I thought, boy, God must be pretty important for my dad, who's a terrible singer, to sing every hymn to him in worship Sunday morning and Sunday evening. God must be pretty important for my dad to do that. And uh, that taught me so much. So praise God for terrible singers uh, and who, who, who make a joyful noise to the Lord. That is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And we have to remember, not all our congregations have good singers. And I've been in some congregations of terrible singers uh, in my life. But, but God wants even terrible singers to sing to him. And so our command is not to enjoy music, but to sing 
to God. Okay, here's my 10th point. The form of what we sing in melody and style must be consonant with the text of scripture or the scriptural truth that we are singing. The form of what we sing in melody and style must be consonant with the text of scripture or the scriptural truth that we're seeing. If we are singing about the condemnation of the, the unbeliever in the final judgment, it cannot be to a happy tune. It, it needs to be grave and serious, or we make a mockery out of the proof that we're singing. Um, if we're singing praise to God for his deliverance, the musical form, the melody, needs to be consonant with the joyful praise of God. What, what we sing needs to match the content of what we're singing. It needs to fit. Now, there's a, actually a lot of latitude in that. You know, I, our Welsh friends love to sing hymns in minor keys. And they can make minor keys sound better than any happy thing you've ever, <laughs> ever heard. Uh, and they're filled with pathos. So there's a lot of latitude in, uh, in, in, in musical style and form and melodic pattern. Uh, but it needs to fit. And sometimes it can be done in a program. Okay, here's my 11th assertion. All musical forms convey real impressions. Some clearer, some less so. So be careful. All musical forms convey real impressions, some clearer, some less so, so be careful. Um, music is used to calm people, to frighten people, to accompany romance, military uh, parades and, and purposes sports, and all manner of things. Do you think the people that compose music for those things intend the music to create an impression? You better believe it. You know when you're listening to a military march. You know, no, no matter what cultures are represented on this call, I guarantee you, whatever cultures are represented on this call, if we heard a military march, we'd all recognize it. I'd recognize a uh, a Croatian military march or a Romanian military march or a Belarusian military march, and you'd recognize an American military march. Why? Because the cadence of the music is meant to assist the marching of the soldiers. And so they all have commonalities, and it's also meant to be pump you up so you have some confidence before somebody starts <laughs> blasting cannons at you or dropping huh? bombs on you or shooting bullets at you or running uh, swords at you. They're, they're, they're meant to, to, to pump you up march and, and get you ready uh, for battle and to instill confidence in the people that are watching you uh, go into battle. Um, so the, the musical... Style and form is meant to create a real impression. Therefore, be very careful about a glib appropriation of pop cultural forms. Because those forms are also meant to create an impression. And sometimes those impressions are contrary to what we are trying to create in Christian discipleship. And you just, you've got to be aware of that. Twelve, the purpose of music in worship is to aid our public and corporate praise of God, not to accommodate our preferences or to reclaim the culture. The, the, let me say it again. The purpose of music in worship is to aid our public and corporate praise of God 
not to accommodate our preferences or to reclaim the culture. I heard, I heard you talking on the call. I think it was Chuck maybe that mentioned hearing a jazz band at, um, at, a, at a particular congregation. Uh, and I suspect that, that that band actually was, in, was in, inspired by the experience of that pastor at another church in New York City. Uh, and I've been to that church uh, in New York City where they use a, a jazz band on Sunday evenings. By the way, I was sitting next to, when, when I was at that church, listening to the jazz band that Sunday evening, I, um, I was sitting next to a, a PhD student in piano performance from Juilliard who was Spanish. And he was a Spanish Roman Catholic who had been converted uh, in that congregation. And I turned to him and I said, what do you think about this jazz band? And he said, I hate it. Uh, I cannot stand this jazz band. Now, this is a musician. He's classically trained, but he can play jazz as, as, as well as anyone. And uh, he said, I'm here because of the preaching of the word of God that converted me. And I just hold my nose during the music. So it was so funny that the, 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 I think the reason why the jazz band had been chosen really fundamentally was to utilize the talents of local musicians that were attending the church. That's a stupid reason to, to utilize a jazz band in a worship. Here's the other thing you need to remember. Jazz was not invented to be a congregational form of, of music. It wasn't meant to, it'd be like me bringing operatic arias in, into the church. Opera, except for the choruses, was not meant to be sung by choruses. It was meant to be sung by individual singers with unbelievable talent. Jazz was not invented to be sung by a chorus. It was meant to be sung by individual singers with unbelievable talent. That's not helpful for congregational worship. Most congregations can't scat sing. Uh, they, 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 they can't work with syncopation very well. You, you, you have to use simpler musical forms. Um, so our job is not to try and reclaim whatever the, I, I, have a, I have a friend that went to New Orleans and he deploys New Orleans jazz in his worship service. That's a stupid idea, really bad idea. Uh, and, and again, it's because he doesn't understand these basic things. Those forms, our job in worship is not to reclaim local forms. Our job in worship is to help people sing. And, and that means that the singing has to be simple enough for them to be able to do it. Okay, here's the 13th uh, assertion that I wanna make. Music has powerful emotional effects and associations, and so it needs to be handled with care. Music has powerful emotional effects and associations, and so it needs to be handled with care. M music has the power to move and express emotions. And so you have to be really careful not to manipulate people with music. I have, a, I have a friend who's a Baptist pastor uh, in Washington, D.C. He's actually in Hamburg, Germany today, uh, speaking to a conference. And um, he, he likes to say this, Ligon, no one has ever had an, a spiritual experience on a high C. Now, what he means by that is when, when some tenor or some soprano sings the high note and the hair stands up on the back of your head, that does not mean that you have been moved by the Holy Spirit or, or made to love God more or even expressed your love to God more. It means that you have been powerfully and emotionally affected by a musical form. I, I, was, at a, um, I was at a Ligonier conference when, uh, when R.C. Sproul had um, a tenor sing a, a song about Amazing Grace not not the not the hymn Amazing Grace, but sing a song about Amazing Grace to the famous Irish tune of Danny Boy, uh, which is actually the, the name of the tune is London Derry Air. Uh, and everybody in the room was crying. Well, 
they were crying because that tune is very evocative. Be careful about confusing an emotional experience with true worship. M music, Calvin warned about this. Zwingli warned about this. You want music that uh, allows the heart to, to be joined with the truth in expressing praise back to God. But you have to be very, very careful about producing an emotional experience that is not worship in spirit and truth. So you got to be very careful about this. Now, that said, because music has powerful associations, it is super helpful in helping people memorize. Um, most of the scripture that I have memorized in my life, I've memorized because I've sung it. Uh, I can't tell you how much I have memorized by singing. And that means Psalms. It means uh, various of the, of, the, of the poetry or hymnody uh, in the New Testament. Uh, psalms and paraphrases, etc. I've, I, I, I remember things when I've sung it, um, and th that's what it's meant to do, right? We, 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 and so you want to make sure that what number one, what you're getting your people to sing, is memorable, and then number two, you want to make sure that what is memorable is something that you want them to remember. <laughs> you know, if if you get them to sing bad words to memorable tune, you're infecting them. You're not helping them. So you want to make sure that what, what they sing that is memorable is something you want them to remember. Um, this also means that music both has the power to discipline and corrupt the soul. Music has the power to discipline or to corrupt the soul. And we need to be aware of that. Okay, 14th assertion. The content of everything that we sing must be biblical. That is, its theology, its doctrine must be scriptural. Now, as I've already said, my, it is not my personal view that we can only sing psalms or only sing the words of scripture. If some of you have those views, I'm happy to talk with you about it. And I would love to worship with you if you only sing psalms or only use the words of scripture. Uh, none of us should have an objection to that. But it does mean that just like our preaching and praying, it needs to be ordered by scripture and filled with scripture. So, you know, every word that you preach does not come right out of the Bible but it better be biblical. Uh, it, it better be derived from the Bible. It ought to be according to the Bible. It ought to be filled with the Bible. Every word that you pray does not come directly from the Bible, although scripture prayer is the best way to learn how to pray. Uh, so your, your prayer ought to be ordered by the scripture and filled with scripture, even if not every last word that you say in a prayer comes from the Bible. Same with our singing. Our singing needs to be ordered by the scripture. So sing sound and substantial psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Okay. Now that leads me to my 15th point. And, um, and, and my 15th point is just a suggestion, a suggestion on what you might sing. Now I, I I've actually got, five pages of material here and four minutes uh, to go over it. So I'm, I'm going to skip over a lot of this. I'm going to send it to you. You can read it for yourself. Um, what I'm about to give you as a list of psalms and hymns and songs is primarily from the English speaking world. So I, you're going to have to clue me in onto the realities of Eastern and, and Southern Europe. So just recognize that. I realize this is primarily English speaking, uh, although I, you would be surprised how diverse the tunes are in English psalters and hymnals in terms of where they come from. There's Italian material. There's East European material. There's 
Central European material, Western and Northern European material, Spanish material, you know, you can go on and on and on where it comes from. Um, but this material is theologically compatible with Protestant churches in the Reformed world. That is Presbyterians, Baptists, Anglicans, Congregational, etc. These hymns would find themselves at home in churches where the Westminster Confession of Faith, 39 Articles, London Baptist Confession, New Hampshire Confession, Savoy Declaration, etc. are esteemed. Second, these hymns are found in the Trinity Hymnal. Uh, the so-called Red Trinity Hymnal is published by the PCA and the OPC. Um, and uh, attention has been given to make sure that the lyrics of the hymns are theologically compatible to Reformed Christianity, as well as to historic creedal and confessional Christianity. Um, third, for those of you in significantly multi-ethnic or cross-cultural settings, you have to have, there's an extra layer of work that you have to do uh, when you're thinking through hymnody. Fourth, I have not tried to produce a list of hymns that covers the whole scope of Christian doctrine, but I have tried to think of hymns that could be used to win over a congregation from more superficial singing to more substantial scriptural singing. Um, fifth, as I've already said, sing Psalms 2. I'm going to give you a, a list of some of the best metrical psalm texts and tunes to encourage you uh, to them. Um, in an ideal Protestant Lord's Day service, there ought to be at least some psalm singing. They, they're just, they, we just need to sing psalms more. Um, I've not listed Christmas carols because they have kind of stood the test of time on their own without help. It's the rest of hymnody that has suffered in the last 150 years. Uh, seventh, this is a work in progress. It is not inerrant. It's not infallible. If you have suggestions for me, uh, I, I'd love to hear them. And then here, finally, I just want to say I have a pet theory. So don't start a new denomination over this. I have a pet theory that the average congregation uh, singer, the average member of a congregation cannot or does not know more than 200 songs, hymns, or texts. That is, even in churches that sing a wide variety of traditional Christian hymnody psalms and songs, uh, probably only two to 400 songs are sung over a relatively short duration in the life of that congregation. And I don't think the average non-musician member really knows or perhaps can know more than about 200 songs. And most of us, I think, probably know less than that, maybe as few as 50. And so what's my so what about that? So what? You better be really careful about what you sing. If you've only got 50 to 200 songs, they better be good. You, you cannot avoid fluff. You've got to have good stuff if they only are going to know 50 to 200 songs. And that's my, you can argue with me about that, but that's my, that's my pet, my pet theory. Now, I, I, I give you a list of things that you can sing. Uh, part of the reasons I give you these songs is because I still think they work in contemporary English speaking settings. Maybe some of these translate well into your settings, but it's just something for you to think about. It's not a list of hymn favorites. It's a list of things that I think still work. And, uh, and I, I, like I say, I'll send you, as soon as the call's over, I'll send this to, to, to Kirk and David and, and Chuck and let them get it out to, to the rest of you. It's, um, it's all right here. So my time is up. It's 9.31, Q&A time. Oh, 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 oh,